Good afternoon. This is John Mayfield, and we want to welcome you to our broadcast. Uh, it's a real pleasure to begin our master series today with Jack O'Connor, who is with the Denver 100 LLC in Denver, Colorado. And Jack is going to discuss the 10 rules of leadership characteristics. And I am very excited to uh, have to introduce Jack. And I'm going to give you just a brief uh, introduction about Jack and his company and then we will turn it over to Jack to talk to us about the 10 rules of leadership characteristics. So um, Jack O'Connor started his real estate career in 1978 and he became a top producer in a 700 sales agent firm. He's participated in over 2,000 transactions and has sold in excess of 380 million, and that's right, million in sales volume. Jack is the broker owner for the Denver 100 LLC, an innovative real estate services company in the Denver metro area. He's been recognized as manager of the year by a large Denver firm and was also awarded the executive of the year for innovative leadership techniques. In addition to being nominated as Ernest & Young's entrepreneur of the year, he's spoken nationally. Uh, let folks know that Jack will take some questions at the conclusion. So if you want to type those in, I'll be monitoring the, uh, the questions. And Jack's going to uh, let me know when he's ready at the conclusion. Uh, I think he said his talk's right around 45 minutes long. So Jack, thank you. And uh, we will let you begin. It's an honor and a privilege. And welcome to our CRB Master Series. John, thanks a lot. It's, uh, and thanks for the participants today. I'm going to give you kind of a nuts and bolts uh, in this series and it's really you've got five really great people throughout the series over this month so and all of us will be speaking at the NAR conference in November so I, I hope you attend our, our programs I'll update you on when mine is but the the leader characteristics uh, when I'm training branch managers or coaching other owners of companies I start with mastering these characteristics because here's what we have seen in the marketplace changing just over the last even two years. The dynamics of brokerage, leadership, and management, if we had to go back and look at the history, really required us to have lots of different skills to be able to manage agents that were brand new to the business and experienced people. We had to manage many different facets. Well, as the economy tanked as in most markets, we found that the leader of the brokerage firm and or the branch manager absolutely had to have more hats to wear just because of the, la the economics of running the business. So these characteristics that, that I'll share with you are designed, let me see if I can get by here, these characteristics that, that we've identified kind of going in order of what you need to learn. I, I would tell you that anticipating brokerage for 2013, the reason you're going to have to master these skills and master these characteristics is that the production in all our markets appears to have been up this year over last year, which is good news. The inventory in most of our markets is lower, so it creates a sense of urgency. But skill development in our sales force has been frankly lacking. So you as the leader of your company or branch are going to need to adapt these skills because you're going to need to have higher producing agents next year. There's going to be a segment of that agent population that's going to list more properties and in turn will sell more. However, because of the online experience of the buyer pool, regardless of which on online site they check, the buyers are more sophisticated to call the listing broker directly. So we're finding more and more of these skills and you managing top producers to be critical in your, in, your, in your business plan. So I will tell you, if you wanted to create listing machines in your firm, you're going to need these 10 characteristics of where they are. So the first skill I want to share with you is taking ownership of your business. Now that in itself seems like an oxymoron. However, you're going to find that the daily behaviors that you do as a leader in your company may or may not necessarily directly meet what you're trying to achieve as your goals. So what I encourage you to do is to be able to list five activities 
that will help your company grow every day. And as simple as that is, that's probably what you're telling your sales force to do. But the five things that I have to grow our companies, and I've had companies as large as 500 agents and managed small offices as many as 20 people, but when you're managing a, an operation, there's five things that I can break it down for you to take ownership in every day. And the first is talking to your current agents. If you have 100 people in your, in your branch, as an example, to get to talk to 100 people in a given month is hard. You're going you're gonna to not find them. They're going to not be around. They may not show up to all the events or meetings that are there. But you have to make a conscious effort every day. Is, do I have to call two people a day? Do I have to reach out to three people a day? Pick your number of people, but talking to your current agents about their business and about what their, their highs and lows are in their business right now, because they're going to have successes and they're going to have failures, you've got to reach out. So the first thing in taking ownership of your company is to talk to your current agents. Pretty simple plan. The second thing is talk to agents outside your firm. You are an attraction machine. And unless your firm is attracting people all the time, the, the amount of people knowing about what you're doing diminishes quickly. There are so many new real estate models that enter the market that are trying to capture your, your agent population. You've got to be talking to other people outside your firm. The one dialogue that I use in talking to people is to ask them how they see the market over the next six months. You don't necessarily have to hit them over the head about joining your firm, but you definitely have to make it a behavior every single day of can you and I have a cup of coffee or can we share five minutes about where you see the market going? I, you know, you're a top producer in the market and I'd love, to, I'd love to pick your brain. That dialogue gets me in front of more people every single day than I can ever shake a stick at. The third thing you need to do in your ownership model is have some branding or PR about your office or company on a daily basis. The messages that you send are critical to the success. Now, social media has given us a platform as leaders to be able to post something on a Facebook wall or, or tweet or to be able to have a LinkedIn message that's not, that's not uh, too egotistical from the standpoint of people are used to seeing Facebook posts every day. So whether it's a sales meeting event going on in your, in your company, whether it's wishing somebody a happy birthday, whether it's being able to say, here's a charity that we have just sponsored, here's a golf tournament we've done, et cetera. But the third, the third part of your ownership technique is being able to brand and or PR your, your office and company on a regular basis. The fourth thing that, and this is one technique that has worked well for us, uh, in my coaching of owners around the country, I can tell you some of them hesitate to do this because they don't want to they don't want to start a dialogue. But I think it's important in taking ownership in calling up the people who just listed with you and or the buyers who just used one of your agents to buy a home. The conversation is real simple to me. If I used to send form letters out thanking them for listing us, and I I thought that was pretty impersonal. So what I do at the end of every day is just take the listings that we take. I call up um, the numbers that, that I'm provided by our listing agents, and I call up that particular owner and just thank them for doing business with our firm. The goodwill that's spent just on that one point uh, and the good news that I get about how our, our sales force is acting out in the field is worth volumes to me as an as a owner of the company. So calling buyers and sellers is the fourth ownership technique. The fifth thing is creating an inspiring environment. Um, ownership of a company is more than just placing your name on the sign. It actually is creating an environment that people want to come to on a regular basis. So there may, there may be social functions that you do. There may be things that um, create fun and excitement throughout your office or your company on a, on a pretty regular basis. Some of the ideas that, that I have that we do is because the experience level of my company is pretty high, we tend to do more uh, educational and social functions tied together, and they like that environment a lot. Uh, the, the program we did this morning, we had 100% of our people show up. Um, we had a photographer there to take pictures so that we did do promotional pieces. 
uh, on Facebook for our people. So that, that's, a, that, that's a thing that works well for us. So those are the five things when you take ownership of your company, you, you're just looking out for activities that absolutely match the results you're trying to get. The second characteristic that you're looking for is a commitment. People in your organization will follow committed people. There may be people in your marketplace that you can list and just see how committed they are. And it may not necessarily be real estate related people. It could be someone in a different industry. But I can tell you, following the traits of people who are committed are very exciting. There's, uh, even though I'm in Denver, I get a lot of uh, communication from around the United States. And there's realtors all over the, the southwest part of the country right now that are doing really great things in promoting their company, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook. Um, they are starting their own TV channels because it's less expensive today. They are committed to making their brand the thing that people remember when talking about real estate. When you do a, a job like that, then it makes it much easier for your sales force to go out into the marketplace and say, where are you? The other thing on commitment that I'd share with you is how you dress as a leader and how you present yourself in the marketplace as a leader is a commitment to the community. Um, we write a particular market stats blog on a regular basis that gets distributed to our own personal blog, but the agents put it on theirs. And it's a commitment that comes out the fourth or fifth of every single month that they can commit, they, they can count on. And this, this market stats has been uh, written for 15 years by me. So, we have a passion for what our real estate agents are doing, and we want to commit to, to their business. We want to make sure that they know we're, we're there. So that's the second characteristic that you want to try to master. I don't know a list that wouldn't include attitude. Um, you can have a good one or a bad one, but whatever one you have is going to stick with you. So I would tell you the first thing that I've seen in brokerage firms over the last four or five years is having a financial attitude. Everything was, boy, we got to watch every penny, and rightfully so. My companies did the same thing as well. But you need to know who you are from an attitude perspective. Um, you know, if you're not a cheerleader and you try to be a cheerleader, for example, that, that comes across as just phony. You need to be a consistent attitude that makes sure that people know you're going to get the job done. There is no quitting in this, in this endeavor. This is our deal. Now, Keeping Salesforce uh, attitudes up is a whole different story because they're, they're dealing with the hand-holding emotions of trying to work with buyers and sellers that may or may not complete the transaction. In our marketplace, and I suspect in many around the United States, we have a non-equity position market. And what that means to me is that the sellers are just not that happy of selling. So trying to keep a high-paced attitude to a seller who brings money to closing or is, or is in a distress situation a third of the time, uh, or even if they're not and they walk away with m much fewer dollars than what you anticipated, by all means, the, um, the attitude that we present to those particular clients is going to be critical. The best, that, the best way I can tell you to keep your attitude high is there's two things, is to introduce new ideas to yourself as a leader or to continually keep your environment fresh. And when I say your environment, your, work, your workplace, don't let your particular office or workstation, per se, get stale. Try to keep it fresh. Try to keep it new for yourself. That will, that will spread amongst your sales force. Fourth characteristic we have here is loyalty. And I'm going to spend a little time with this because loyalty to me is a two-way street. Um, in coaching broker owners around the United States, uh, one of the things that we try to overcome as roadblocks is a we and they attitude. The, it, it's, not, it's not a successful characteristic when you have that scenario of they, the agents, are doing this to me, the broker. Uh, it, it can't work. So you have to honor your loyalty as a, as a fundamental core value of your company. And the only way you can prove that is to trust them as in certain aspects of your business. Now, that's 
some people don't like to leave that control when we talk about loyalty. But loyalty is one of those core values that I can assure you agents will and, and Salesforce will stay with you forever if they deem that there's a loyal broker owner in place. And I've, I've noticed it in company after company across the United States of those successful entities where they have developed a two-way loyalty trait between the two parties. Now, how do you do that? The, the, the first and easy answer is it is so easy to get caught up into the victim rumor mill in the real estate world. So you want to you don't want to remain silent if someone's talking bad about one of your agents or or if a seller or buyer calls you as the owner of the company or leader of the company to complain about one of your agents. The, the absolute best loyalty trait is to not comment until you have 100% of all the facts. Sure, we, we are stuck in the middle many times of rumors that neither are true nor can we fix. However, when you want to speak uh, about loyalty and protecting your agents, it's very critical that in a stressful situation of either a complaint and or a transaction with a co-op broker that you're not overreacting. The agent that works with you will absolutely see your loyalty in protecting their interests. In essence, they stay with you. Probably one of the, the, best, the best strengths that I've seen uh, in this loyalty aspect is being able to develop a coaching mechanism where you uh, individually go through the four disciplines of real estate with every single broker that works with you. Again, if you have a really large office, you're going to be busy. But the four disciplines of real estate that you can convey to develop a loyalty amongst your sales force, one is um, business planning. Everybody hates to, to use the word business planning or strategic planning. They just hate goal setting. So the average agent doesn't get that. In my company, I call it production pathways. And the reason I call it that is being able to develop a production pathway that's specific to that individual. We may have one sales associate who's real good with open houses, and we may have one that's a real good geographic farmer. But the two of them wouldn't necessarily have the same pathway to achieving their production. So I changed the word business planning to production pathways, and that's, that's worked really well for me from a customization standpoint. Again, if, if your company is really large, it takes a lot of time to do that. The second discipline in, in your personal coaching with the individuals is being able to improve their skills. I mentioned earlier that I see that mastering these skills is going to, you have to be listing machines moving forward in 2013 and 2014. As the inventory has reduced in most of our marketplaces, which is good, we still need to be able to have better skills in listing property. If the online experience for the consumer is going to be 90% of the people are going to check out homes first before contacting a realtor, absolutely do we need to make sure that our sales force, their skills, represents getting more listings. So it's just obvious that we have to have better skill development. The third aspect of disciplines is systems analysis. Salespeople, for the most part, have very, very weak systems. They're relying on the brokerage firm to be able to create checklists, to be able to have a system for IT, have a system for communication. So you develop a real loyalty with these people when you can create this discipline of systems analysis for them. And uh, when I do, a, when I do a, a, um, a review of our toolbox with our agents, they, they love that review. It's real easy for me to be able to say, okay, show me, show me your, what you use as a daytimer, whether it's Outlook or whether they have a PDA or they, or they use an iPad. I want to see what they use for their, for their systems. And it, it's really amazing to me how disjointed their systems are. So you help them there. And the fourth discipline in creating a loyalty is working their strengths. If you've, if you've not read any of the books, uh, Strength Finder 2.0, or, or Donald Clifton's book, you know, Strengths, that was written, you know, really in the, in the early 80s. Those books, and Strength Finder 2.0 is a new book out on the market that gives you a strength analysis online, which is, which is really a great thing for your sales force to, to take the online, online test 
they pay for it, of course. It costs about 18 bucks for the book, I think. But they get a free code to be able to check in. And once you know what their strengths are, then you can manage them based on their particular strengths. It's not just following a disk profile. It most certainly, if somebody is really good at relating to people, I want to develop a production pathway that gets them relating to people. I sure don't want them worrying about paperwork. So you develop this loyalty, and it's probably one of the core characteristics that you can have by having those four disciplines. The fifth characteristic I want to talk about is trust. I don't know how you operate a, a real estate brokerage firm today without having people trust you. So you, you should always have some guide or, or I call it trust meter that allows you to, you know, make some promises and you're way over delivering. So if you're going to deliver some kind of program, event, system, keep it low key that this is the way it's supposed to happen. Whether it's lead generation uh, through an, uh, a search engine optimization site or whether it's purely just a uh, uh, a company retreat you're going to have, way over deliver. The anticipation and I can assure you that trust goes way up. People are overwhelmed um, when you over deliver. One of the things about trust that I found is we're all going to make some mistakes and I put on this slide for you that um, in today's world everybody knows your mistakes. It seems like they're out there <laughs> that you can't get away from it. So I've learned just go immediately to your sales force in some format. I'm not a I don't like delivering messages via email because I think they can be taken out of context. So I tend to do a lot of things face to face. That's just my style. But in some cases, if you had a large firm, it's very difficult to be able to get a quick message out on on the error that may be made. In some cases, it's easy to fix with an email. In some cases, it's more delicate to get face to face. Whichever method you're going to take, you do it immediately. Just make sure that you get by that problem. Otherwise, they gunny sack those problems. It creates a distrust of your company. And that's usually when people look other directions and your retention value becomes hard. So trust is one of the things you've got to have. It's just it's, it's a given. But by all means, it is a, it's a quality that you can work on as you go forward. If there's one of the characteristics that I think each of us work on every day, it's communication. You communicate in so many different ways. You communicate on the phone. You communicate with text, Twitter, Facebook, email. You're communicating in training classes, in sales meetings. You're committing, communicating with a some media group. Uh, you, you are out there as the leader all the time. And your skills of communication have to be as strong as anybody in your marketplace to compete with. So if you haven't taken a communication or a leadership platform training, highly encourage you to do so because you are the person that's going to lead them through whatever whatever the good or bad may be. All right? You have to be really confident in your communication skills and you have to be able to convey ideas in a way that illustrates the benefit to the audience that you're talking. A lot of brokers talk a lot, but they don't necessarily get to the benefits of what's in it for the agent, why should the media believe that our real estate market's better. You know, it's great that we have a better real estate market, but as soon as Kay Schiller report comes out that may be 30, 90 days old, the media will believe the Kay Schiller report because of the history of that. There's a trust confidence there. You want to you wanna change a communication level. If Zillow has a particular estimate that you don't like on a particular home, how do you communicate in a positive fashion those, those things that adjust your business? Because your agents are facing this on a regular basis. So as a leader, you have to be able to be prepared and get ready. So I, I would say um, whether it's a sales meeting or training class, you want to know the topics in advance. You want to be able to be prepared. It should be an event that is worth coming to. Um, uh, the question I get qu quite regularly about our training and sales meetings, are they, vo are they voluntary or mandatory? And everything that I do in the companies I've managed for 25 years has been voluntary. It is the only way for me to be able to have a litmus test to know if the people are really coming because they value it 
or if they're coming because they're threatened. Now, you can believe that or not believe that, but my, my success has been as a result of providing some outstanding program that is way better than anything they thought they'd get and having an attendance of far exceeding 90% of our, our total aging population. So this communication part really does come into effect. Um, I'll tell you a story about I was coaching a broker and and he was having trouble communicating with the sales force about a change in their in their plans and, and nobody likes to change compensation plans but this guy had a trust factor problem because he, he kept saying uh, when he saw that there wasn't a real embracement of, of his ideas that he would say oh I'm only joking well if you ever have to use the line I'm only joking as a leader and you have to defend and or explain the situation, you're going to lose the communication battle 100% of the time. So try to avoid some of the snafus of communication that, that naturally happens to us because we don't get the responses we necessarily want to achieve. So let me just make sure that your, your body language matches, you know, matches your desire of what you're trying to achieve. Make sure that your, your walk matches the talk. If you're confident and you're walking that way, that's why I personally believe leaders need to dress better than their competition. Uh, I, I, I know that we're in a more casual society these days, but by all means, regardless of the dress that you wear, it has to be appropriate for the kind of business that you are in, and you communicate that in many, many different ways. In the Denver marketplace, there's one day I could be selling horse property and have to wear you know, jeans and boots, Another day, I can be selling a loft in downtown Denver that's a million dollars from someone who's from Boston, and they're going to expect a certain dress there. So your communication in all aspects of your business is critical to being able to work through it. But, but with communication with your agents, to get them to change their action behaviors, you have got to be clear because the number one reason real estate agents fail in the marketplace is because a lack of clarity of task. And I can tell you that the people that I've trained in, in my company, they average 22 sales a year. And the reason that they do, they're clear in what they have to do to sell real estate. You have to have that kind of level of communication. And it may be morphed with the person that you're talking to because we all as adults learn a bit, little bit differently. Some see better than hear better. Some want examples. So you have to be better prepared. This is, a, this is a big part of what our success and characteristics really leads us to be. Accountability is one of those things we all hate to, to consider. Um, profitability is your scorecard. Through the last decade, the companies that I've managed have been profitable every year. Now, I would say to you that some of the profits were smaller or we had to really squeeze them to get there. But that's our scorecard as a leader. And the minute that you try to avoid the accountability of profits in a company that you own, everybody else in your company makes excuses for why they're not selling real estate. Now, as the marketplace has increased, so has the number of realtors in the market. They jump in, they jump out of the market quickly. So as the marketplace improves, you'll see a higher level of number of competing sales forces that are out there. So your sales force needs to be accountable for their own P&L as well. Uh, one of the real easy programs on QuickBooks that you can have your, provide to your sales is really pretty simple, is provide, a, is provide them P&L statements on their own business. Are they looking at their business as a business or are they looking at it as something else? Now, not everybody is going to embrace the numbers the way you might. You probably know your P&L statements inside and out. You probably know exactly where your money is going and where it's coming from. The average agent doesn't. So the accountability starts with the firm. But by all means, it's a, it's a, it's a, a different kind of atmosphere when you're providing that support mechanism for your sales force. And regardless of the size of your firms, you, you need to know where, where all things are going. One of the things that uh, I learned from my very first broker was he told me that the market is the market. 
and it is. You're not going to influence, unless your company controls 30 or 40 percent of the market share, you're not going to influence the market selling more or selling less in many cases. You, you're pretty much going to you're going to roll with where the marketplace is, and and so we need to be able to make an accountable statement to our sales force that we are profitable on a regular basis. And here's why we make the decisions to be profitable is to provide you the kind of environment that you can be profitable in. So this negative trap or the negative victim rumor that happens is not good. It's, you have to avoid it. Um, I think bouncing yourself off, whether it's a leadership coach or a coach in um, maybe another branch or another firm outside of your marketplace is a good thing to have. You'll find that there's plenty of different people around the United States that will help you. And the RB Council is one of the best. I mean, you have plenty of people who are members of this council who are willing to give back to help you get better as a leader. So let accountability kind of be your characteristic for yourself that, hey, we can all be better and more accountable. But if we are to ourselves, I can assure you your sales force becomes accountable to themselves. And then you have a very profitable company. Your reticular activating system is this little gland in your brain that says, I'm focused on this thing. And focus is probably a uh, characteristic that we all have. You wouldn't got, have gotten to a leadership position had you not been highly focused on the activities and the behaviors that you need to do. But really, what do you want from your company? How many agents you know, do you want to have that are productive, and what do you need to be productive to, to match your goals? Do you know exactly what your net income is per transaction? After expenses, after uh, gross commission income, do you know exactly what your net net is on the transaction? And how do you how do you make how do you improve that? When companies talk about improving, you know, five, six, seven percent in bottom line, that is a pretty significant number. So I want you to look at, you know, are you focused on trying to achieve a lot of different things with productive agents? And when you don't have productive agents, is your model one that is okay with accepting those if you're receiving cash up front? Because that may be okay. But you know, productive agents to me is, are they meeting your goals and are you focused enough to be able to match those habits with what you want? In identifying focus, I, I train salespeople. They, they are really good. The example I'll give is I'll say, if you see a new yard sign in your neighborhood, you're looking at who listed the property, how come you didn't get the listing, how come it didn't get up to bat? Well, I suspect you as leaders, when you see someone move from one company to another, that you are you're taking notice. How come they didn't come talk to me? More than likely, you probably didn't ask. So part of your focus goes back to those five steps of ownership that I talked about on the first slide. Are you focused on growing your company the way you want it to grow? And are your daily act actions meeting the kind of results that you're looking for? The majority of your efforts really don't take but a couple hours a day. And I know how hard management is. Uh, I know how hard it is to lead a company. But by all means, if you really look hard at what you're expected to do, a couple hours a day of really being focused, you'll be able to go enjoy other things with your family. And you'll be able to go take vacations and play golf or do whatever you do. Focus is one of those things that get the job done and get, get through it in a regular basis, not reacting to the ever number of people who are trying to pull your energies in many different directions. So stay focused in your characteristics. Changes at Breakfast of Champions. Um, it, with my sales force, I don't really say we're going to change things. I say we're going to grow in this direction. And although change is one of the characteristics as a leader we need to be able to accept, it's inevitable that's happening. And the change will occur faster. But by all means, you need to be able to embrace change as part of your everyday business. And here's, here's some easy things to break, break the change barrier for your company. For example, there's not a time in my offices that I don't change something, whether it's a, move a piece of furniture around, maybe paint a wall, 
uh, change the type of coffee that's available, change the bottled water that we have, etc. Changing the environment little, people notice what you do. And it, you're always changing it just to tweak it, not necessarily to turn the proverbial can upside down. But by all means, you're, you're embracing these changes, and it's much easier for your sales force to grow through change if they see that you're handling on a regular basis, whether it's a, an MLS change that changes the dynamics of your systems, if you have a particular intranet that you're down, you know, uploading up to Metrolist and they change, you have to have a way of changing those forms. If it's something as simple as the state law requires a different type of disclosure form, so be it. But you have to be able to change with what the consumer and what your agents are seeing and they look to you as how you embrace that change. But I can assure you in managing thousands of agents, they, they hate the fact that we as leaders are willing to change more rapidly than they have the enthusiasm by which to do so. So I caution you, you embrace it, but you introduce it slowly. And uh, unless you're going to make a significant change in your company, uh, we, we were merging with companies that, three years ago or so, and it was very interesting to watch the dynamic of the agent pool have to change dramatically. Uh, when you change cultures like that, that's a, that's a hard thing to do, and you have to be prepared to be able to do that. So think about, think about change as one of those characteristics that you have um, kind of planned for. You know, think about changing a few things in your office cosmetically, and you'll find that it works better for you. Finally, you are an attraction machine. Winning teams of real estate are always attracting new people. Um, unless you want to be an office of five people that all own the office, and they're likely not to leave, your, your primary role is retaining the current sales force and attracting new people that match the culture. Um, attraction is one of those things that we, call, we can call it recruiting, we can call it whatever we want to uh, do in our market, but by all means, people become attracted to you and your firm based on the first nine characteristics that we talked about. And if you're not mastering the first nine, you can't be very attractive to people. They, they just won't come to your firm. Um, sometimes you get to hire people, sometimes you don't get to hire them. But don't allow a defeat to be a permanent setback. Uh, more than 80% of the leads you get from people coming to your firm are coming from your own sales force. If your own sales force gives you a name of someone and for whatever reason that person was not attracted to your firm, that throws a, a question mark into the brain of your current agent. So please remember you're attracting all of your salespeople as well as people that you would like to attract from outside your firm. So if you have some major recruiting program going on, please include your agents in attracting them every bit as much as you would attract someone outside your firm. Attractions to me comes from never ever quitting, never ever giving up on the scenario. Now you, you may tweak the pathway, but by all means I don't have the word quit in my vocabulary. That just is not gonna, that's not going to happen. And Maintaining that competitive edge as a leader in the marketplace, you, you, you have to get up on the horse again when you get knocked off. And it really is that, it's really that simple. Um, people are attracted, even in my firm now, we'll, we'll interview one or two people a week. Uh, because of the standards of production, we may not take many of them. Uh, but it's nice that people want to come to a particular level uh, uh, of standards and, they, and they'll be attracted to that. But they're attracted to many of the other characteristics the company affords. And I am convinced that, that if you can master the first nine, this one becomes much easier. So as we've mastered these ten characteristics and become more efficient in a brokerage firm, I, I want to share with you first of all that my, uh, I, I'm doing two programs at the NAR conference, but the one for uh, broker owners and managers of companies is titled 40 Irrefutable Laws of Real Estate Brokerage. It will be Sunday, November 11th at 11 a.m. at the Orlando Convention Center. So I, I hope if you're in Orlando that you'll 
you'll stop by and say hi to me or if you'll you'll want to come to that program and these educational series uh, that are provided by the council are really really good for the majority of our membership and you guys are obviously on this you know call and I appreciate that but tell some other you know uh, CRBs to maybe take a look at these things because I can tell you that the educational opportunities uh, through the council are are bar none the best in the industry. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to you and questions. And uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Jack. Wow, what a great uh, a great session. I I was typing away with notes, and uh, it's been a very enlightening and a, a lot of great information. I, I I love what you said about dressing for success and dressing. Uh, appropriately and I think that I've always tried to do that myself and I think that has uh, has been your your team appreciates that and I know the folks in the community appreciate that as well so I've got a lot of great notes and information we want to invite you to ask some questions now uh, to Jack regarding uh, any of the leadership characteristics he talked about and uh, you can type those in and I'll read those to Jack so we can go over those um, you were you. One of your points you mentioned was about getting um, getting leadership, getting involved with leadership. Um, pull my notes back up here, but getting involved with a leadership coach. Uh, and I know you said there were several good uh, folks in the industry. Do you have any? Uh, if someone was interested in finding a leadership coach, a, a suggestion, or is that a service you provide? It, it, it is, John. It's a service that I do provide. I, I usually only work with five broker owners a year, so it's not. I don't. Um, uh, it's not a mass production coaching program because I find that it, it's pretty time intensive, and for me to be able to meet my goals in the company, I I don't want to uh, be out there. But I do. I do provide five options, and when I speak at NAR, normally I'll fill those five up, and um, most coaching programs should have a beginning and an end. Uh, mine is six months, uh, two hours a month where we go over the four disciplines of, of real estate. We kind of go in depth with each company's you know, vision of what they want to try to achieve at the end. And at the end of the six months, we actually evaluate whether it's worthwhile for either of us to continue. Um, okay. Because I, I, I think prob one of the problems with a lot of coaching programs is it doesn't seem like there's any end to it. And I really think, for me, um, I, I think I have to see people really growing to be able to say, well, yeah, I want to take on another six months. But, you know, the, the, the one coach that I recommend is not a real estate-related coach. It's a guy named Brian Gast. Uh, name of his company is Quadrant, and I don't get anything for it or any like that. But Brian was a business, a very highly successful IT business owner and has had a coaching company for years in the Denver area, but he coaches around the United States. And those kind of coaches sometimes bring a newer light to us than just real estate related coaches. And, uh, and I'm sure that there are plenty of fine real estate related coaches in the industry that, you know, that are brand names that you would know. But I, if I had to endorse one, it would be Brian and, and I, uh, can get anybody his contact information if they need that. Okay, great. Thank you. Now we have a question from one of our attendees. How does Jack get his agents to accept the need to make and follow a business plan? And so how do you how do you get your agents to accept and follow the need for a business plan? And I love what you said about um, a production pathway. I thought that was awesome. So I'll let you answer that question. And we've got a couple more coming in here. Okay. I do. I start with a production pathway now, and that usually gets the attention of salespeople because they're all into m making money easier, faster, more. They're all that's that's what they're doing. So the the way that that, that I try to create a production pathway is if someone wants to earn a hundred thousand dollars, does their daily activities actually match what they want? And it's real easy for me in 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 golden olden days of management. You could say, "Open up your day timer and show me who you're going to talk to today." In today's world, the the average agent is using many more different contact methods, whether it's Facebook 
or whether it's uh, email, I, I break it down pretty quickly to face-to-face -face contacts or some electronic media. Because I want to lump all that electronic stuff as a, as a coach for these people. I want to lump that in because that has such a slow return on their investment that if I can get them in situations to get either face-to-face -face or on the phone and make it non-threatening to them, their production pathway goes up. But some people are going to be better um, doing it in a, um, in a workshop format where, where I... Uh, I may run something uh, for agents, um, seven tips on how to improve the value of your home. And I have a series of agents who are good at inviting people to things. So I, I would run a small program over a lunch hour. To, they can invite their people. It could be after work, but we do a lot of things during the business hours that work for us well. I have other agents who get face-to-face -face by doing drop-bys. That's a Buffini program You know that he you know, does a drop by or a pop by, I think he calls it, and some some of the, some of the agents like that. I have to know which one they're using to get face to face or on the phone, and their production pathway will clearly be how I approach them with those contacts. Now, most of my people have more than 20 years of experience now, but when I was training a lot of newer licensees, the frequency by which you would talk to someone about their face to face contacts it has to be greater than someone who's been here quite a while. So I would spend time, you know, once a month, tell me how, tell me how it's going out there. I want to learn as, as a broker. I, I, I use this dialogue quite regularly. I want to learn what you're hearing out there because you're probably seeing more people than me. Now, that's probably not true, but I definitely want to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're contacting more people than me. And so that, that is how I hold them accountable because they know I'm going to do that. It's not a surprise to them. They're not going to get, they're not going to get a, a a message from me. Come in and talk to me about your about your contacts. They, I don't do that at all. Part of the agreement of working with me is is it okay if I ask you how your contacts are going? And when I get that permission, it it, it absolutely works well in holding them accountable because they almost always come to me first and saying, Jack, I'm having trouble. I'm not talking to anybody. And if they're coming to me, I can fix that problem. So that's how I do it, John. Okay, great. And to kind of build on that, we've got a couple more questions, and I know we've got just a few more minutes. But um, one of uh, a follow-up to that is: so if you had someone who's been in the business for ten years, they're making sixty to seventy thousand a year. They want to grow their business, but when you bring business planning into the equation, they kind of look at. And I see a lot of veteran agents do that. They kind of look at you like, "Well, that's for rookies." How do you how do you work with those folks to, to get them to? Well, to again, buy I don't I don't ever say I, I ask them how how much do you want to grow your business to? So let's say they want to go from sixty thousand to a hundred thousand as an example. That'd be a significant mm -hmm. increase. So the questions that I would ask at that point would be: If you want to increase, what are you willing to do differently that you're to increase this income. So I let them tell me what they're willing to do. Invariably, they're going to be more difficult on themselves because they know the answers. It's not they just need to have something simple. So once they give me their answer, I can say if I could put you in a spot to increase your production from 60 to 100,000 and you don't have to work a whole bunch harder, would you be willing to do it? And of course, it's a rhetorical answer that right. I can guess to. So when when they get to that point, then I'll say, and let's and the ultimate problem is the agents do not have really good systems of staying in front of the the, the public. They don't they don't have good methods of doing that, and the average agent doesn't want to be considered a pest. So it's much easier for me to run a program. Um, to have them invite people to things. So in our company this year, we ran four different programs. We did a an economic symposium in March. We did uh, how to improve the value of your home by 5% in June. We had a golf tournament in September. And then we have a client function coming up um, the first week of December. So our agents who are really not good at getting in front of people have four events to invite people to things to. And on the fourth or fifth of every month, I have I have a 
uh, a blog that's called So How's the Market? That's the title of the blog. And every month, I create this blog that allows the agents to customize it for themselves. So when they're asked the inevitable question, how's the market, instead of saying something non-relationship building like great or unbelievable, they can say, well, were you aware that the inventory in condominiums in Denver has shrunk by 52% from August of 2011 to August of 2012? All of a sudden now, they have a specific topic to, to answer a legitimate question, so how's the market? Then they can say, are you thinking of maybe doing something in real estate right now? Unless you can train people to buy into saying something about asking for business or getting them in front of enough people, their production won't change. They know that answer. They're just not willing necessarily to do those things themselves. It's a great, it's a great idea and a great point. And not only is that probably a wonderful benefit for your agents, but it's probably a good recruiting tool as well when other agents see that you're providing that. Uh, good, great information. Um, we did have another question here regarding coaching. Uh, that was what what criteria should a broker use to evaluate whether a coach is right for them? Do you have any guide or input that a person could could um, know that they really need to hire a coach? On a, on a leadership level is I think you have to match philosophies of business. Uh, if you have a, a, I don't think a coach can be all things to all people. And I, I, I think you have to have a business philosophy as an individual to hire a particular coach that matches your philosophy. Because you're wanting help in your world, not that coach's world. If the coach has a philosophy that you have to do it this way, um, that's probably not the person that's going to best work for you unless you agree with that particular pathway that the coach is taking. Um, and I've, I've, I've personally hired about four or five coaches in my leadership career, and I've been frustrated with four of them <laughs> because they, they tried to change me into something they thought I should be, and, I, and, and that, that doesn't work for any of us. We have particular strengths and we're typically going to work those strengths. So in, in hiring a coach, you want to hire someone who can work with your particular qualities and strengths and build upon those, not try to bring your weaknesses forward and say, oh, you really have to be better at paperwork or you have to be better at uh, some other aspect of the brokerage firm. I, I, I would tell you that that's the number one criteria to make sure that you hire someone who has a business philosophy that mirrors yours to be able to improve on your strength. That coach is going to provide you new ideas. That's really what they're there to do, is to give you new ideas to operate within your own firm. Because you, Excellent. You, you can't change your firm. Uh, it would be way, way too hard to turn your firm upside down and say, oh, God, I've come to the mountain, and here's the tablet. And by the way, we're changing everything in the company. That would destroy your trust with your agents. They would not believe that. Excellent point. Thank you so much for that. A good, good, uh, great questions from our audience. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more, and we will see if we get another question that comes in. In the meantime, I do want to remind everyone who signed up for the Master Series next week at the same time, Steve Murray will be on discussing thriving in the future, how real estate professionals can thrive in uncertain future. Steve, um, actually is the creator of real I believe it's a real trends newsletter and um, um, this is an excellent uh, presenter just as Jack was today so you're going to want to catch that Ken Barris is the following week uh, Ken has showed me he's going to be talking about seize the data how to drive business through hyper local analytics and I I have seen Ken present this and it will absolutely uh, blow your mind it is so fascinating very interesting we have Steve Harney the week after that, Leadership and Real Estate Today. The key ingredient is switching from survival mode to growth mode. And then our last week on October 31st is Michael Crissa, Gorilla Video Marketing. He's the interview guy, does an, all these, everyone. Jack, we just um, appreciate you so much. All these speakers in our Master Series are uh, we're just so fortunate to have. I, I remember listening to an audio uh, little audio book. I listen to it all the time and uh, it was 
guy by the name of Jim Rohn, and he talks about how he listened and followed a millionaire to, to really get to where he was. And it just has always pressed upon me because, Chuck, when I look at your credentials and I, and I see what you've done, um, you're the kind of guy that we all need to, to listen to and, and look up to. And I know you provided just a wealth of information today. So thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate everybody on the call today and, and uh, look forward to meeting you in, in Orlando on Sunday afternoon at your presentation, or 11 o'clock in the morning, I believe it is. So. Yeah, 11 o'clock. Thank you very much for having me today, and thanks to the participants for being there.